you've got a problem here. And this was a problem for the, <clears throat> the Orientalists, those who supported Islam, not Muslims themselves, but great thinkers and great uh, scholars in the 19th century and in the 20th century. And in the 20th century, so a, about 100 years ago, well, uh, you had a, a doc, Dr. G Montgomery Watt. Dr. Montgomery Watt decided to solve the problem because you just can't find any reference to Mecca anywhere at all. So he said, hold on, hold on a minute. How did Mecca get its importance? Because if it was such a, you know, if historically from what the Quran tells us, from what the, all the traditions tell us, see that the traditions are all written in the 9th and 10th century. They're written two to 300 years after Muhammad. Did you know that, Koredi? Yeah. yeah. You didn't know that. But see, many of your hearers don't know that. Mm -hmm. All the traditions, Ibn Hisham is the first. He's the first to write down the biography of Muhammad. He was writing, well, he died in 833. Muhammad died in 632. So that's 200 years after the fact. That's the first we have of the biography of Muhammad. Then you have Sahih Bukhari, you have Sahih Muslim, Ibn Dawud, Ibn Tirmidhi. Those are all the, the hadith, the sayings of Muhammad. Well, the first one mm -hmm. of all the sayings that were written down was Al-Bukhari, and he dies in 870. That's 240 years after Muhammad. So you can see a problem with that. Sahih mm -hmm. Muslim, Ibn Dawud, Tirmidhi, yeah. all came after Al-Bukhari. But the man you need to go to to find about the history of, of, of the world and everything we know is the historical context, what we're talking about today is Al-Tabari. You need to go to Al-Tabari. He died in 920. That's the 10th century. That's 300 <laughs> years wow. after Muhammad. 300 years after Muhammad. Mm. And that's why there's such a problem here. That's why there's such a problem here. Mm -hmm. Because what we're saying is, what we're saying is, maybe I should stop sharing here just to make this important. What we're saying here, Koredi, okay. is that obviously there, if this is the guy that we need to go to to find out about the history of mankind, because he's the one that introduces the tahrik, which is the histories, and he's the one that introduces the tafsir, which are the commentaries on the Quran. And it's those commentaries and that history that you find about Mecca. All right? Did you find about the Jahiliya period? That means the period oh. of ignorance. That all these people before mm. Muhammad were all stupid, idiots. Mm. That's really what it's saying. And what I'm saying is, hold on a minute. They were not idiots. <laughs> they were not stupid. Please, don't call it Jahiliya. This is not a period of ignorance. It is the time that Muhammad comes that all the ignorance starts to appear. Because they are making claim after claim in the tafsir and in tahrik. You're making claim after claim about Abraham and Moses. And yet, almost in every case, they've got it wrong. They got the wrong man at the wrong place doing the wrong thing at the wrong time. What was Abraham doing in Mecca? He never was down in Mecca. And yet there it is in chapter 21 of the Quran from verse 51 to 71. In Mecca, going into the Kaaba, destroying all the idols, coming out the next day, the Muslims then throw him, uh, they're not the Muslims, well, the Muslims would say they're Muslims. They come and they throw him into a fiery pit. Mm -hmm. How idiotic can you get? What's Muhammad doing way down south there? See, why haven't anybody asked this question before? What's Abraham doing in Mecca? That is not historical. Mm -hmm. Nobody, no historian will agree with that. Because Abraham never went that far south. Look at yeah. all the references to him. There's nothing at all that would put him that far south. Now, let's get back to and let's continue on with the PowerPoint. Okay, so that's why I'm bringing this up. It's important that we do unpack that. So here comes Montgomery Walk, and he brings in this trade route theory. Now, here's the trade route theory. Look at this map here, Corede. This is a map yeah. that shows what what the world would have looked like when Islam was being birthed, okay? So this is a map made in the 20th century, looking back at the 7th century. So you look on the right, the Middle East, Hijra, AD 622. So this is the time when Muhammad supposedly went from Mecca to Medina, right? That's what it would have looked like at that time. If you look at it carefully, you will see a lot of the place names don't make sense because they're not the names that we use today. So if you notice, Yathrib is the name for what is today Medina. Do you see Yathrib there? If you look on the west, western side yeah, of yeah, Arabia, yeah, just yeah, above Mecca, yeah, if you go yeah. way up to where Baghdad is, Baghdad is not called Baghdad, it's called Stesiphon. Yeah, you can see Stesiphon right there in what is today Iraq, straight up above the, the, uh, the, uh, the Persian Gulf. So there are lots of different names, and they're not the names we would use today. These are the names from the seventh century. Okay, so just to show you, show you what I'm why if people get confused when they look at this map. Now, what did Montgomery Walk say? Well, all the trade coming from the east—that means from China, from Burma, 
from India, all those countries. Now, those are those are not the names of those countries at that time. I'm giving them modern day names so people know what I'm talking about. Yasat Qadi got all upset with me for saying that Cairo was the name of the city <laughs> in the seventh century, uh, and that that you know that uh, that Baghdad was the name of the city in the seventh century. I never said Baghdad was the name of the city in the seventh century. Yeah. I'm using the name Baghdad so people know who I'm talking about. Because if I used Stefan, mm. no one knew what I was referring to. If I had said Fustat, exactly. they would not even know what I was talking about. So you have to use modern day mm. names, okay? So people know what we're talking about. Yeah. So all those countries way over in what is today China, what is today India, when, when they brought the trade over to the West, they were going to the Mediterranean, they could not go up North because of those mountains here where my cursor is. I don't know if you can see my cursor. See the mountains up here? That's the Hindu Kush, those are the Himalayas. So that stopped them from going that route. They had to come to the West coast of India, which is here. And they had to take their goods across from the West coast of India where you see that black arrow and they had to go up through the Persian Gulf, where you see that other black arrow. And from there, they would take mm -hmm. it across land over to the Mediterranean. So that's the route. That's the route that everybody knew what the trade went. Now, that's not disputable. No one disputes that. OK. Mm -hmm. If you look at all the historical material from the second, fourth, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, up until the seventh century, that is the route of the trade. Well, not 7th century, let's say up to the 5th century. Because in the 5th century then, you had two large kingdoms. You had the Sassanians, who are the Persians, which would be Iran and Iraq today. That's the Persian kingdom. They were Zoroastrians, the religion. And you had the Byzantines over here, which is in Turkey and further west. But that would be the Byzantine Christian kingdom. So they had the Byzantines and the Sassanians started battling each other back and forth. Boom, 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 boom. And because mm -hmm. of all those battles from the 5th and 6th century, that shut down the trade going through the Persian Gulf because it was too dangerous to bring it across land uh, from, uh, from uh, over, over land uh, at that time period. Oh, for, see where Basra is. You can see where Basra is right there. That's the, uh, the, uh, the head of the Persian Gulf. They could not bring it up through Basra, through Stesiphon, and on over to the, uh, the Mediterranean world. So they had to redirect their trade. So Montgomery Watt says, this is what happened. Since they could not go that route anymore, they had to then for come this route across the Arabian Sea over to Aden. See Aden down there, which is today yeah. still there in Yemen. And they would mm -hmm. take all their goods off their ships there at Aden. And then they would go across land, 1,250 miles straight up the Western coast or the Western plateau, not the coast, not the coast, but the Western plateau all the way up to Gaza in the north and to the Mediterranean. So that was the Mo what Mo Montgomery Watt says was the trade route theory. That's why Mecca then became important. Why? Because Mecca is right there on that trade route. Now, Dr. Patricia yes. Krona looked at this. Dr. Patricia Krona in 1987 wrote a book about this called Meccan Trade and the Rise of Islam. Now, Dr. Patricia Corona is rather unique. Not only is she from Denmark, but she is a scholar of high repute. She could, she's no longer living, she died in 2015, but she could read and write 15 languages, all archaic languages. She was wow. head of department at <laughs> Oxford University when she wrote her book, head of department in Isla, on Middle East studies, she could read and write in 15 archaic languages. Many of those languages no longer exist today. So she decided, mm. to, and she looked at this, she said, there's a problem here. Here's the problem. Let's look more closely at, the, at Arabia, okay? So the goods are coming from Aden down here. Mm -hmm. They're going up to Taif there, right? There's Taif, which still exists today. And mm -hmm. then from Taif, they go Definitely. down to Mecca here and then come back up to Yathrib up there. Now, hold on a minute, she said. <laughs> Taif is on the Western <clears throat> Plateau. So is Nazaran, Sana, Taif. Yathrib mm -hmm. is on the Western Plateau. You can see the plateau, mm -hmm. there, all the mountains there. Khaybar, yeah. Taima, and all the, are mm -hmm. on the Western Plateau. But Mecca is not there. Mecca is mm -hmm. off the plateau. It's down a thousand meters. Yeah. Why would they come to Taif, mm -hmm. then make a jog down to Mecca, and then go back up a thousand meters to get up to Yathrib, when Mecca had no water, Mecca had no grass, Mecca had no vegetation to feed the camels. Why would they do That's that job? That didn't make sense before they then went on up mm -hmm. to Gaza in the north. Just by looking at the map, she says, there's a problem here. Why mm -hmm. had no one noticed this before? 
More than that, hmm. take a look at this map again. If they're coming across here down to Aden and taking off all their goods there at Aden, does that not also pose a problem? Can you see a pro another problem with that? Now, my 10-year-old son saw it right away when I asked him this question. What's wrong with that theory of going right up the Western Plateau? Koredi, can you see a problem? Hmm. Yeah, I, I'm actually looking at it that why, why would they have to go down there? I mean, it, it's like you're going off the road completely. Well, they have no other choice because they can't go the other direction because there's war. War's going on. So that's understandable. But what are they doing if they're leaving the western coast of India? They're leaving on what? On boats. Am I correct? Yeah. Yeah, why that's do you true. Go on boats? Why do we why do you always use boats? Because, because of waters. It's the cheapest way to go. Okay. Right? Water is the cheapest way to go if you want to take a large uh, let me uh, Dr. Patricia found out that if you take a ton of goods, one ton to take a ton of goods by land and by sea, that same ton of good would cost the same amount for 50 miles by land, just 50 miles by land would cost the same amount as 1,250 miles by sea. Wow. For just going 50 miles by land. Because why? Because you have to have camels, you have to feed the camels, you have to house the camels, you have yeah, to protect your goods yeah. about the decoys, you have to travel over land, the wear and tear that goes on, the heat that's there, you can only travel at night because of the because of the heat, You could, and you have to sleep during the day, all these problems, plus you have to buy the camels to begin with. Boats, however, mm -hmm. they're already made, they last, mm -hmm. they don't have to be fed. Boats float yeah. on water, which costs nothing, no one charges you. And you don't even have yeah. to feed them. You just let the wind push them. So boats are by mm -hmm. far the cheapest way to send goods. And you can put much more on a boat than you can put on a camel. Right? That's true. You can put even tons to of on a boat. Whereas even you have to, to have today. hundreds of camels, camels to, to mm -hmm. equal one boat. So because of that, mm -hmm. it's prohibitively expensive to go overland unless you have to really, you have no other choice, especially if you're going inland. But if you're not going mm -hmm. inland, you're going over to the Mediterranean the best way to do it is by boat. Am I correct? That's true. So now look at the map again, and where is the problem here? <sighs> look at the Red Sea. It's yeah. Why did they go? Um, on, it's a why did they just go up the Red Sea? Okay. See. Patricia Crone asked a perfectly logical question. She says, "Hold on a minute, everybody. Look at a map again." If you're already on boat, everything's on boat, you've sailed across the Arabian Sea, why in the world mm -hmm. would you take everything off there at Aden and go 1,250 miles by land? That's how much, it, that's the distance from Aden up to Gaza. Why would you go 1,250 miles by land when you have a waterway? Why don't you just keep it on board the ships? Go right up the Red Sea. Oh, I, yeah, I think I can see what the problem is right now. I mean, they should have just moved on the sea straight up. They should have continued on the sea. It exactly. made no sense to take them across land. It would have been too expensive. Did, did no one ever question this before? And she was the first to question this. For 1,400 years, no one bothered to look at a map until she did in 1987. So she decided to go one step further. She Now remember, she reads and writes 15 languages. She decided to go back and check this out. So she went back to the trading documents from the second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, and she could read them all because she reads those languages. She reads the languages on the Western coast of India. She reads Syria. She reads Nabataean Aramaic. She mm -hmm. reads all these languages. This is, remember these, these, this time, second, third, fourth, there was no Arabic. Arabic had not yet been invented. Arabic is a new language. I don't know if you know that. But wow. <laughs> the Arabic we use in the Quran, it was only being created, was only being written down for the first time in the seventh century. Muslims know that. They know that because when you look at the oldest manuscripts of the Quran, they only have 16 letters in the Arabic. Today we have 28 letters. Where did the other 12 letters come from? They had to be created because of how, how hopeless Arabic is. It's one of the worst languages to communicate in with only 16 letters. That's why 
it's kind of stupid to say that Arabic existed at the time of Abraham and Moses and that Jesus spoke Arabic. No, none of those. Arabic never existed that early. And so as a result of that, you can see when she looked at all these trading documents, she came across a completely different scenario. Guess what she found? She found hmm. what? That what they were not taking their goods off in Aden at all. What was happening, they were coming this direction. That is true. They were coming across the Arabian Sea. They couldn't go up the Persian Gulf because of all the battles that were going on up there. It shut mm -hmm. down the Persian Gulf. They came to here, but they never stopped. They may have stopped at Aden to get provisions. That's true. They would stop mm -hmm. to get provisions, but they never took off any of their goods there. They never did. They went straight up through here, right up through the Red Sea. And the city mm. that was in charge of all that was this city that I just circled, Agilis. The name of Agilis, which was the capital of that time of Eritrea today. What is Eritrea today? The capital back then in the 7th century was known as Agilis. And it was the Eritreans that controlled the trade. Their names are all through the trading documents. There are no Arab names on any of these documents. Oh. Let me repeat that. She couldn't find any Arab references on any of these documents except for the people in Aden. But that was just because they stopped there. It was a stopping place to get your provisions before you went up, then up through the Red Sea. All the trade was maritime. It was always maritime from the second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, up until the seventh century. And the, there is no Arab names for a very good reason. If you look at the Western coast of Arabia, there are very few ports. Most Arabs were not people that traveled by sea. They almost all traveled by camel. They were desert mm -hmm. nomadic people. They were nomadic. And that's why all these hamlets along the Western Plateau are, are, few, are, are over 100 to 200 miles away from the sea. They're nowhere near the sea. They weren't interested in the sea. They were not boat people. They were camel herders. We know this. Mm -hmm. This is nothing new that I'm telling you. Mm -hmm. No wonder. That And in one fell swoop, Dr. Patricia Corona in 1987 destroyed the trade route theory, proving that <laughs> Mecca had nothing to do with trade, that there was no trade whatsoever. Now, hold on a minute. This is going to put a, a, a wrench into every Muslim listening to me, because every Muslim knows that the only reason Mecca was important was because it was in charge of all the trade north, south, east, or west. What she did with just one book in 1987 was destroy the whole reason for Mecca being wealthy. How could mm. Mecca be wealthy, therefore? And then, of course, she asked the next question. It's not even on any map. No oh. wonder it's not on any map, because no one had heard of it yet. There's nothing about <laughs> Mecca at all to talk of.